Dogs have rich and complex minds, but since dogs can't talk, we have to, <laughs> we need scientists who can decode dog minds. So in this episode, I interview Dr. Ellen Furlong, a scientist who studies dog psychology and the author of the course, Decoding Dogs, Inside the Canine Mind, which is available from Audible and The Great Courses. Ellen Furlong is an associate professor in psychology at her alma mater, Transylvania University, where she studied mathematics. She subsequently earned her PhD in psychology from The Ohio State University. Before joining the faculty at Transylvania, she taught at Illinois Wesleyan University and spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University, where she helped found the Canine Cognition Center and studied rhesus monkeys at a research station on Cayo Santiago, Puerto Rico. Ellen teaches courses on animal cognition and dog cognition and has team taught travel courses on animal cognition and welfare with her father, a bioethicist. She has won several teaching awards, including in 2018, the inaugural Most Influential Professor Award at IWU. Ellen directs a research group exploring cognition in dogs and zoo animals. She's published papers and presented work at academic conferences on chimpanzee, orangutan, and dog cognition. Ellen recently authored a textbook on learning, which is entitled Learning and Behavior. Her works have been featured in numerous media outlets, including most recently an ABC Australia documentary, A Dog's World. Now, without further ado, my interview with Ellen Furlong. Okay, so I'm here with Ellen Furlong, um, and uh, you are the, the author of the course Decoding Dogs Inside the Canine Mind, which is the uh, audible original, perfect timing. Yes, perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> she always comes in. That's great. Um, well, I, I kind of just really want to jump into it. Um, and I thought we could start kind of at the beginning with dog evolution. Um, so if you don't mind, I just I guess, did dogs evolve from wolves or from a common ancestor of wolves? How, do, yeah. how did that happen? Yeah, so, um, you know, we dog evolution is a really fascinating topic. And we really um, have a lot, a common theme that you'll see throughout the, our conversation today is that we have more questions than answers when it comes to dogs, um, which is, I think, always kind of surprising, given that so many of us live with and around dogs, and that we still don't know so many things about them. Um, and uh, evolution is one of those things. So um, we know that dogs evolved from something like a gray wolf, so probably a common ancestor with a gray wolf. Um, I tend to think about evolution um, where, you, where you have uh, living um, uh, relatives as kind of like uh, cousins. So gray wolves and dogs are kind of like like evolutionary cousins. They have a common ancestor, a great, 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 great grandparent, um, but dogs are not, did not evolve from gray wolves. They had a common, a common relative. Um, in terms of exactly how that evolution happened, we really still don't exactly know. Um, there are several different uh, explanations about how we could have gotten from, um, you know, I, I think the, the craziest thing about dogs is that, you know, they were at one point something very much like a wolf. So giant big predators with massive teeth. <laughs> it would have been very scary to encounter. Um, and we got from them to, um, you know, like my little dog sitting over here with me, um, you know, it, 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 they're so different from what they were. Um, why in the world did we decide to make friends with a predator um, <laughs> uh, first? So, um, so some of the things that we do know are that uh, dogs were, were like the, the first um, species to domesticate. So uh, they domesticated somewhere between 15 and 40,000 years ago. Uh, it can be, it's really hard within that window to tell exactly when that domestication process took place. Um, but having an idea about when it took place can give us some idea about why uh, dog, uh, dogs evolved. Um, uh, on the sort of far end, um, you know, if dogs evolved 40,000 years ago, I'm joined by Olive um, <laughs> right now. Um, so if dogs evolved 40,000 years ago, then they likely evolved um, as sort of um, collaborative hunters. So, um, you know, they and we would have both benefited from um, the hunting skills of the other. So wolves are good trackers and humans have tools. And so it could very well have been that uh, the wolves 
uh, early dogs did the tracking and then humans came along with the tools later and helped um, kill the prey. And this would be good for the wolves because, um, you know, uh, killing an animal it can lead to uh, dangerous situations, right? So you could be speared by a, a deer horn or, um, or antler um, or uh, injured in any other way. Um, and so having somebody with tools can be great um, and it can be useful for humans because uh, wolves have really great uh, senses of smell and other kinds of um, uh, perceptual abilities that humans don't have. And so they are excellent trackers. So if, if, if dogs evolved, early, so 40,000 years ago, that might have very well have been why. Um, if they and evolved, that would be because we were uh, like nomadic hunter gatherers at, at, during that period? Okay. That's right. So yeah, we didn't have permanent settlements. We were moving around really following the prey as they, as they uh, took their migration paths. Um, but later on, so closer to 15,000 years ago, uh, we had settlements. So we were starting to settle down. We were starting to stay in one place. And if dogs evolved then, then they likely did so for scavenging purposes. So we were messy. People have always been messy, <laughs> um, leaving our trash around. And um, with trash comes, uh, you know, excess food that other animals uh, might be attracted to. And so if dogs evolved uh, closer uh, to that 15,000 years ago time, they probably evolved to um, eat our scraps. And in return, we benefited from them because they would bark and alert when strangers were approaching. So they, they sort of acted as security for us and we were feeding them in exchange. So, um, so two possible stories. We don't know uh, which is the right version because there's really a lack of, uh, oh, the fossil record is messy. <laughs> so um, it gets really complicated and, and uh, messy trying to figure it out. Um, a lot of researchers are getting together now trying to work on the genetic analysis and trying to trace back exactly when dogs evolved and where and um, you know how many times they may have evolved. It mm. could very well be that um, dogs domesticated in several different places at several different times for several different reasons. Um, and so it gets even messier. <laughs> so people are working on this right now and maybe in the next few years we'll have um, a more definitive answer to this question. Yeah, that, and that's such a fascinating possibility that there could have been multiple uh, independent uh, domestications, I guess. Um, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, so, so you talked a little bit about the, the different uh, possibilities. Are, is there any kind of um, evidence that favors one over the other? Uh, not that you have to go into enormous detail, but um, anything like that? Yeah, so it's, um, oh, it's, it is so super complicated. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see where to, where to begin. So uh, part of the problem is that we look at a couple different lines of evidence when trying to determine dog domestication. And, and one line of evidence is looking back in the, in the archaeological record. So looking at um, the fossil record, looking at um, traces of, of things that humans have left behind over time, things like cave drawings and um, art. Uh, that that we can find, um, you know, pottery smashed in the in the ground that we can find when, when we sort of dig things up. Um, another line of evidence is the genetic evidence, and that's what people are working on right now. Um, and there's some evidence from there as well. But part of the complication is that when you look back in the archaeological record, say you've got a specimen that you're not sure if it's a dog or a wolf, it can be really hard to determine what kind of creature it is. Uh, usually we don't have the whole um, skeleton of the creature, whichever, whatever creature it is. Um, you just have bits and pieces. And so even with a whole skeleton, it can be really hard. With bits and pieces, it's even harder. Um, I'm a baker, so I like to make an analogy to baking a cake here, <laughs> uh, which is that um, you know, before 40,000 years ago, it's really clear everything is a wolf. Um, all the specimens that we find are very clearly wolves. Um, and I think about this as like when I'm um, baking a cake, um, before I put anything in the oven, it's very clear that I have cake batter, right? It's very obvious um, that this is not, not a cake um, that I would serve up to friends at a, at a party. Um, 
after 15,000 years ago, um, or since 15,000 years ago, it's been very clear that we have both dogs and wolves on the scene. And so we can see skeletons that are very clearly dog-like, skeletons that are very clearly wolf-like, and we can differentiate those very easily. Um, that's after we've baked the cake, right? right. <laughs> um, so it's very clear that we ha have cake, we can decorate it, we can serve it up to people. Um, it's very clearly cake. Um, but when we're in that middle part, when once we've put the batter in the oven, um, it can be really confusing to know exactly when did that batter turn into cake, right? So is it halfway through? Is it, you know, when when in that process? And I think that's part of the issue that's happening here with with our questions of dog domestication. Um, when you look at a skeleton, it could very well be that the skeleton looks wolf-like, but the behavior of the animal was dog-like. Um, because you can imagine it would take a little while for the skeletons to change, um, of, of evolution for those skeletons to change, um, uh, even if the behavior has already started to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it just, it gets really fuzzy. Um, uh, to complicate matters, uh, there are also these uh, other possibilities of things that could have happened. So for example, there's there are a couple of skeletons that appear to be dog-like um, that are from about 30 to 40,000 years ago. Uh, but when you do a genetic analysis and look um, at how those dogs are related to dogs of today, they're not. Um, and so then the question is like, may, maybe that was a failed domestication attempt. So maybe mm -hmm. people were starting to domesticate dogs about then, but this line just didn't go forward. Um, maybe it was a different species entirely. There are lots of species of, of, of canids out there. That's the family that dogs belong to, including wolves and jackals and coyotes, et cetera. Um, maybe it was something like a jackal um, or a coyote that just uh, went extinct and we, we haven't seen. Um, so uh, so that, that adds to this, these complications is um, we don't have a lot of um, remains from 30 to 40,000 years ago. Those remains that we do have are kind of ambiguous um, um, and maybe they're failed domestication attempts, maybe they're species that went extinct. It's just so hard to know. So, um, so it does make things really, really difficult. Um, I think uh, depending on who you ask, the, the geneticists are all going to tell you a different answer <laughs> about when dogs evolved. Um, so I don't think there's much of a strong consensus yet, except that it's within that window of 15 to 40,000 years ago, which doesn't really help us narrow down the, the why question um, much. So, um, Well, that's, that's great. I mean, that's, <clears throat> it's an ongoing uh, search, I guess. And you, you just mentioned the other canids and um, I guess a, a discussion of dog evolution wouldn't be complete without mentioning, mentioning uh, uh, I probably won't pronounce it right, but uh, Bel Belyayev's uh, fox breeding experiments. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk about the Russian farm fox breeding experiments and what that tells us about dog evolution and yeah. yeah, definitely. So, um, so this is another fascinating story. Um, Belyaev uh, was a Dmitry Belyaev was a researcher in um, in Russia. Um, oh, like sixty ish, seventy ish years ago, um, and uh, he was really interested in domestication. But at the time, the study of domestication was really political. So uh, the government had taken an official position <laughs> on uh, how evolution works, and it was not the um, position uh, that's supported by most research, the Darwinian uh, model um, of, of natural selection. So um, uh, Belyaev really uh, disagreed with the government position, but a lot of people were who spoke out against it were being, um, you know, uh, tortured and, and killed by the government at that time. So Bayayev really wanted to do research on this, but was worried about what would happen after his brother was one of those um, people who was who was killed for his uh, his uh, his position on evolution. So. Mm. Um, uh, so what Belyayev did was was pretty clever. He um, he said, "All right, I'll go do my research far away." <laughs> so he went to a fox farm in Siberia, um, and the way that he sort of spun his research was also really clever, which was to say, um, "I'm not interested in evolution. That's not what I'm doing here. Domestication. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in increasing the yield of the foxes." Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, they were breeding foxes for their fur. Um, and so he said, well, um, you know, maybe we can get these foxes to breed twice a year instead of once a year. Uh, and if they could, then that would increase the number of foxes that they could have and then the number of pelts that they could sell. So the government was like, great, go do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the, the, the secret here is that um, domesticated animals uh, often breed more often than wild animals. So um, domestic dogs, for example, can mate and, and breed um, two or three times a year. Whereas uh, wild uh, wolves, for example, only breed about once a year. So, mm -hmm. um, so and you can see that across species. So domesticated animals, uh, tend to reproduce just more often than wild animals. Um, so, uh, so this was the secret to Bel Belyaev's uh, work was that he was really going to work on domestication under the guise of increasing the yield. Uh, so uh, he and his uh, student Ludmilla Trout um, did uh, some really clever work. So all they did was they went in and they selected foxes for tameness. So Tameness is really a trait that people often get confused with um, domestication. So I'll clarify those and then I'll talk about what they did. So um, tameness is a trait that animals, that an individual animal has um, that really talks, that's really about their relationship with, with people. So, um, so you can have a tame dog like Olive just here off uh, camera, uh. <laughs> um, snoozing really hard. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so these are dogs that are um, very interested in humans and have um, uh, are attracted to people. Um, so like when we go for walks, etc., she's constantly trying to go up and make friends with every person that she sees. So um, so tameness. She's a very tame dog, very interested in um, in people. You can have dogs that you know domesticated dogs that are not tame. So these are. Um, you can think about like um, feral dogs, so dogs that are um, sort of living on the streets. Uh, this is a pretty common, actually most dogs in the world are, are not pet dogs, they're, they're living out there and on mm. their own. Um, so um, they're not really interested in people. They, um, you know, when, when people approach them, they tend to move away. And in fact, that's how we often measure tameness is based on flight distance. So um, you know, if, if I, if, if a person approaches Olive, she's going to approach them. So her flight distance is a negative, right? She's, <laughs> she's coming at them. <laughs> um, if, um, if a person were to approach a feral dog, a lot of times that feral dog will move away. So, um, uh, so tameness is the trait that can often be measured just with, um, uh, flight distance and also that varies within a species. So some dogs are going to be very tame. Other dogs are going to be more aloof. Um, uh, domestication is an evolutionary process. So it's at the level of the species rather than at the level of the individual. So, um, so we say that domesticated dogs, Canis lupus familiaris, to give them their uh, Latin name, <laughs> um, are, are domesticated, uh, but wolves, for example, are wild, right? So it's really what has happened to the species and, and how involved humans have been in their, in the species, um, uh, existence. So one of the things we know about dogs is that um, humans have shaped dogs uh, since the beginning. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, so, well, since the beginning of dogs. So, um, uh, so they, humans have been deeply involved in their evolution. So they, they are a domesticated species, but wolves, not so much, right? So, um, so we can, uh, so we need to sort of differentiate between these, these two things. One of the questions then is sort of how do we get a domesticated species? Um, and one possibility that Belyaev was researching was saying, okay, maybe it's just selection for tameness. Maybe what's happening is that um, those wolves who were more tame, more less concerned about putting distance between themselves and people, uh, just kind of did better um, in sort of evolutionary terms. That is, they reproduced more, had more viable offspring, um, uh, left more copies of their genes <laughs> in the uh, going into the future um, than, than wolves who had a longer flight distance, who were more feral, less tame. Uh, and so what he did to study that was um, he and Ludmilla Trout um, uh, went to these 
these fox farms and Ludmilla had put on a, a bite proof glove <laughs> and put her hand in the cages with the foxes. So at first what they were doing was looking for foxes that didn't attack. So just foxes that didn't um, try and bite her, that didn't run away. And they took those foxes and they bred them together. And then they took the foxes that ran away or tried to attack her and they bred them together. So they've got sort of two populations going. Um, uh, she kept putting her hand into the cages of the of the foxes and the the nice foxes, um, the tame foxes. She kept breeding those together, the ones that were approaching. Um, she gradually increased the criteria. They had to uh, not only run not run away, but then they had to approach. Um, and then eventually, it was dogs that, or uh, foxes that were licking her hand, um, uh, wagging their tails, um, approaching her with excitement. Um, and then the wild type foxes that were the ones that were not interested <laughs> in her. So, so they've got these two populations. And what you end up with after a really short period of time, like, um, like just 10 generations, um, uh, you ended, they ended up with these foxes that were um, these, these domesticated foxes that were opening their eyes earlier, um, that were um, starting to wag their tails. And after 50 generations, what you've ended up with are these foxes that are extremely dog-like, <laughs> extremely dog-like. Um, as Belyaev predicted, they started to reproduce twice a year. Um, the, their coats changed colors. So you get um, coats that look more uh, multicolored. So like, like Olive here. So Olive has lots of colors going on. Uh, mm. That's unusual in the wild, um, <laughs> but it's pretty common among domesticated animals to have a lot of different colors. Um, their ears started to flop over. Um, uh, they started wagging their tails and their behavior became more dog-like. So um, uh, they would ap approach people whining and lick their hands and generally be excited to see them. Um, and so what this suggests is that that story about uh, tameness could very well explain how dog evolution happened in the first place is that in selecting is that in selecting for tameness or animals that were not running as far away from people, um, you can get in just a few generations. I mean, 50 generations is a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. Um, you can get massive behavior differences um, in these animals. So it's pretty, it's a pretty fascinating experiment. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it kind of leads us into a, a discussion about cognition um in dogs and i think you in the in the course you do something really useful where you differentiate between cognition and intelligence i was yeah. wondering if you can kind of define both of those and explain their their differences definitely definitely yeah so so just like um uh and just like tameness is a trait that can vary across individuals um uh, in the same species, so is intelligence. And intelligence was really designed to measure um, uh, differences in processing ability between um, individual humans. So that's really where this concept of intelligence has come from. Um, when we are talking about animals we're, and, and humans in, in some ways too, um, we spend, we are much more interested many psychologists are much more interested in thinking about cognition. Um, and cognition includes, um, uh, the, the major difference is that we're not doing anything comparative here. We're not saying, um, you know, this, this species is smarter than this species or this, um, you know, uh, this dog breed is smarter than this dog breed. Um, rather, what we're doing is we're saying, like, here are the ways that they process the world. Here are the ways that they sort of approach the world or, or understand the world around them. Um, and, um, and, and, and those differences can be incredibly amazing and, and beautiful and fascinating. So my, my favorite example of this um, is, uh, is memory. So humans, we often compare other animals to ourselves because we think we're the smartest and the best and the greatest, um, but, uh, but our memory doesn't hold a candle <laughs> to the memory of scrub jays mm -hmm. who are these little birds that live in California and they remember um, where they've hidden 40,000 different um, seeds throughout the winter. So Jeez. our memory, we do like seven plus or minus two, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 40,000. <000. laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, and it's it's really amazing the kinds of, of things that they can do. Um, you know, back to dogs, our um, ability to process scent information is not super great, um, but dogs can smell. Um, you know, they just blow us out of the water <laughs> uh, with the kinds of things they can do. I've started um, taking Olive to um, a class called Barn Hunt. Um, and so Barn Hunt is, um, uh, they take the, they take, put rats in these bite proof tubes um, and then they hide them around um, bales of hay. And so the, the dog's job is to go in there and locate the rats and alert their owner to where the rat is. Um, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, um, uh, so Olive started doing this and within like two days of practicing this, she had it figured out. She could smell where the rat is. Um, wow. Her alert is about to play. So she wants to play with the rat. So she goes over and she bows at them. <laughs> <It's really cool. laughs> That's <great>. so, <laughs> um, so not all the dogs want to play with the rats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she can, you know, there's all these huge bales of hay and all kinds of other distractions. And she goes in there and she knows exactly where the rat is. It's not a problem for her. It's super easy um, I, because she's using her sense of smell that we have no, you know, we have no way to even conceptualize what the dog's world of smells is like. Um, and so I think that a lot of times we think about um, when we're talking about intelligence, we are sort of holding ourselves as the human species up as the pinnacle, smartest, best uh, species out there. And we're definitely not. Mm. <laughs> um, other animals beat us in a lot of, uh, in a lot of really fascinating ways. Um, so I think a much more interesting way to think about this is to think about cognition. So cognition really is sort of how do you process the world and what kinds of um, uh, you know, mental feats are you able to do? Um, and I think that, that that is really a much more interesting way to think about it. Uh, the way that I often sort of define cognition to my students is as flexibility. So, um, you know, if you're, you can think about it sort of as opposed to an instinct. An instinct is really, not super flexible. So for example, if I get something in my eye, I'm gonna like blink my eye many times to get the thing out of my eye. I can't really control that. Um, it's just something that's gonna happen. Um, but um, if say, um, let's see, uh, they're doing construction on the road outside my house and I need to take a detour somewhere, I can figure that out in my head and I can flexibly adapt to that uh, changing environment. Um, that's cognition uh, as opposed to the automatic blinking of my eye. And so if you look at, um, you know, there's lots of different aspects of cognition. There's memory, there's communication, there's um, problem solving and decision making and um, oh, attention. I mean, the list goes on and on perception. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to sort of think about cognition. Um, and so I think that uh, one thing that we don't, um, uh, necessarily appreciate enough is that uh, the thing that makes uh, an animal smart is really that ability to use their cognition to uh, survive and thrive in the, the environment that they're in. And so what a scrub jay is going to need to do to survive and thrive in a scrub jay environment is really different than what a human needs to do to survive and thrive in a human environment. Um, they need to remember those 40,000 locations <laughs> of those different seeds if they're going to survive the winter. <laughs> that is incredibly important to them. Um, but I mean, if we were trying to remember 40,000 things, uh, we would not have the mental capacity to do the other kinds of things that we do, the, the complicated social interactions, the language, the, all of it, the tool use um, that, that we do. So, um, so it's really about sort of fit into your particular environment, your ecological niche, um, as biologists call it, um, and, uh, and, and really focusing on what each species is kind of bringing to the table for their own ecological niche, um, I think is a really fascinating um, way to think about evolution in the world around us. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it feeds into uh, this question that you address, um, which is like, and it's an ill-posed question, I guess, but what are the smartest dog breeds? And maybe you can um, 
fit in a, a discussion of trainability sure. versus intelligence. And um, yeah, so just go, take that, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is one that I'm asked all the time, or sometimes I'm not even asked it, I'm told it, right? I'm told. <laughs> You know, I have a border collie and it's the smartest dog breed. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> or, you know, I've got an Afghan hound. And so he's not very smart. Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> so I, I think this this definitely goes back to that question of, of the ecological niche, right? What was this um, uh, what was this creature bred to do? What, what uh, kind of environment are they in? Um, and different breeds are gonna be bred to do different tasks. Um, over the last few hundred years, we've really been selecting dogs um, specifically to do specific jobs. So um, Olive is half blue healer. Um, so she is, um, she's a little bit of mixed up everything, but, <laughs> um, but her, uh, you know, we'll stick with the blue healer part. Um, she was bred to bite cows in the face <laughs> and, um, and get them moving in the direction that the, um, you know, that the, that they want the cows to go. Um, she's bred for long distance travel. So endurance, um, they, they move up to 20 miles a day. Um, so, um, so she's got these particular traits um, that allow her to do her job very well. And, um, but if she were asked to do a completely different job, so um, she hates to swim, um, <laughs> if she were asked to go out in the water and get retrieve a duck, um, she would be like, mm -mm, I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, so, you know, so these different um, uh, things that we have bred these dogs to do has led to different um, ways that they kind of approach the approach the world. So, um, so some dogs are really going to be, um, have been bred and selected over many generations to work in close concert with humans. So um, herding dogs, for example, um, border collies, um, again, that's one that everybody talks about, border collies, Australian shepherds, um, uh, poodles, um, dogs that have been bred to really work closely with people tend to score very high on these tests of um, smartest dog breeds ever. Um, but it's really because they're scoring high on trainability. So they're dogs who really want to work with people, want to learn from people, and are really eager um, for a job um, and for a person to give them a job. <laughs> um, dogs that tend to score low down on that list, again, like that Afghan hound that is typically at the bottom of the list every time, um, are breeds that are more likely to have been bred to do work independently on their own. Mm -hmm. So um, Afghan hounds are coursing sight hounds. And so their job is to spot prey and just chase it, <laughs> chase, uh -huh. chase, chase. They don't need a person, right? That in fact, a person is going to slow them down and get in the way of them doing their job. Um, and so they are much more independent. They don't want to hear from you, right? They don't want you to tell them what to do because they know what they need to do. Um, and you're too slow, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're too slow. <laughs> keep up um, with them and uh, and do the job that they need to do. So um, so a lot of those lists really are about um, how trainable is the dog and not really how smart is the dog. Um, all of these dog breeds are really good at the job that they've been bred to do. Um, and so if you think about smartness as being your ability to do the job that you, you know, came into the world set up to do, um, then they're all pretty smart. <laughs> they're all ready to do the job, um, but they're just more or less uh, ready to take direction from, from us, from people. Yeah. Right, right. And there must be some uh, variation even, you know, within breeds where some are, are more, um, apt to doing whatever their, their job is, um, better yeah. than others. I remember that my, my dad, uh, has had, um, English pointers for a long time and, um, his, his dog was from the litter, the one that showed the most, um, excitement about hunting birds. And, and that's what he does with him. So, uh, yeah. it's, it's interesting to see those, those individual differences too. Definitely. Yeah. And there are even within breeds, there are different lines. So you can have like a pet line or a show line or a um, working line. Um, I did I did Olive's DNA test, which is how I know she's half uh, blue healer. <laughs> and um, when I look at her, 
um, you know, it tells you like her cousins and she's got a half sister, um, you know, I can see all this on, um, on her DNA. Uh, it's like ancestry or 23 and me. <laughs> um, uh, they're all working line blue healers. Um, so oh, I'm wow. like, oh, this explains so much of the chaos in my life. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. The working lines are the ones they need the job. They, they are going to do it. They, um, there are a lot of them are um, of her line are titled agility dogs. Um, so it explains a lot of her, um, high need. For yeah. Action. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. She's a professional athlete. Um, she is a professional athlete. <laughs> that's great. Well, I want to, I want to return to, um, dog human interactions in just a bit, but, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, the brain scans that have been done with dogs. And um, I guess just first how, why that's unique for, for animals that uh, yeah. dogs are some of the only animals that, or maybe the, I can't remember the only species that we've done scans on. Um, no, there are others. So um, people have done work with like uh, rhesus monkeys, but they have to be in tubes and like restrained in order to participate in these, in these studies, but the dogs don't need to be so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, um, so basically what what uh, Greg Burns and his colleagues in, at Emory have been able to do is uh, put dogs into an fMRI um, An fMRI is a functional MRI. Um, Oh, sorry, my foster kitten. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so um, basically, it can explain. It can show you what kinds of things are happening um, in the brain when an animal or a person is awake and alert and um, doing cognitive things. So in humans, a lot of times we'll um, ask people to say make a decision. Um, you know, gamble or not gamble, or um, uh, you know, choose option A or option B, right? Um, you know, different kinds of things while they're in the MRI, fMRI, and see what kind of activation um, is happening in their brains while they're making these decisions. Um, and of course, it's really fascinating to look at non-human animals too and see what's happening in their brains um, as they are making decisions. But this is really hard <laughs> because um, being in an fMRI is, a, is, is uh, unpleasant. So, uh, you know, I was in a car accident a few years ago and, and uh, damaged the shoulder and had to have an MRI. And uh, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's loud. You're in a really tight uh, space. Um, it's, uh, you have to be still for a long time. It's just, it's just miserable. And so a lot of the research with humans doing fMRIs um, you know, you get a lot of these sort of artifacts of people being uncomfortable, um, or, you know, you have to control for people moving around and that kind of thing. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, it's kind of impressive that they were able to get any research done with, uh, with dogs at all using an fMRI. Uh, but what, what Burns's team did was um, to send dog owners home with a sort of a fake fMRI, so like a tube that the dogs had to go in um, with a little chin strap that they set their chin on um, and they're trained to set their chin <laughs> on it and stay there perfectly still for 30 seconds to a minute, which is an eternity <laughs> for <laughs> <Yeah>. a dog. <laughs> um, it's so long, um, but they're able to, um, they're able to learn it. Um, all the while, um, they're wearing earphones um, because the fMRI is super loud. Um, and then they play on high volume speakers, the sounds that an fMRI makes. So basically they're, they're training the dogs to put up with this really uncomfortable situation. It's loud, it's tight. You have to sit still for a really long time. Um, and they're training them to do that at home um, before they ever bring them into the lab. It's amazing. <laughs> they have, I think, well over a hundred dogs now that they've done wow. this with, which is just, it just blows my mind <laughs> that they can get that many dogs. Um, and so uh, the thing that's super cool is that they're, once they're able to train them up on these, uh, on going into the fMRI, they can put them in the MRI, on the fMRI um, and give them different kinds of situations and um, see what's happening in their brains. Uh, so one of them, uh, one of these um, 
sort of a, a really easy one is some, something similar to what um, humans do. So humans have in our temporal lobe somewhere around here, something called the fusiform face area. Um, and so this is a part of the brain that's really responsible for processing um, uh, faces, um, either faces that are real, like, you know, we're looking at each other's faces right now, or fusiform face areas are going, um, or sometimes faces that are not real, like, um, uh, uh, you can see faces in like a grilled cheese or like yeah. in the moon, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, um, we are really good at trying to find faces where no face might exist. Um, and so um, uh, interesting, it seems like dogs have that fusiform face area too. So you show them pictures of faces and landscapes and that same general area in the dog brain um, activates. It's, it's getting to work um, when they're looking at faces, but not when they're looking at landscapes. So, um, uh, so we can see some similar activation in dogs' brains that we see in humans. Um, one thing that we know about human brains is that we have um, this, uh, and sort of in, towards the front of our brain, we've got this a system called the reward system, um, which is um, activated when we are um, experiencing something good. So, um, you know, eating a piece of chocolate cake <laughs> or, um, you know, having somebody tell us, give us a compliment sort of out of nowhere. Um, uh, we often have that reward system will, will go to work. Um, uh, that reward system will also go to work if, for example, we see a picture of a loved one, um, then, then uh, our reward system activates. Um, so, uh, so Greg Burns and his colleagues did some work looking at this very question with dogs um, of will their reward systems also go to work um, when they are, um, you know, reminded of their, their favorite people. Um, so, uh, so Burns and colleagues had uh, dog owners wear a, um, like a, a, an absorbent pad under their arms to collect their uh, scent. Uh, for a little, for a few hours, um, and they had uh, a few different groups do that. So they had the dog's owner do that. They had um, an acquaintance do that. So somebody the dog knows but not super well. They had a stranger do it, um, and then they took scents from uh, familiar and unfamiliar dogs as well. And what they found is that um, dogs' reward systems went crazy <laughs> for their fami familiar person. Um, so they really were um, uh, very, it seems like they are very happy uh, to see their, their favorite person um, as opposed to um, a stranger or a, um, uh, an, an acquaintance. Um, they also found that, uh, that this, this was true even though the, dog, the dog's olfactory um, cortex, so the part of the brain that processes scent information, was more active for strangers than for familiar um, individuals, both human and dogs. Um, so it seems like they were processing that scent information a little bit more for strangers, um, but it didn't make them happy, right? The thing that made them the happiest was smelling their favorite person, um, which I think is, is very cute. <laughs> That is absolutely. Um, and I, I remember uh, one other experiment you mentioned in there, which was uh, the, the uh, looking at um, praise by their owner versus food given to them by their owner. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like um, uh, like praise activates that reward center um, more than more than the indication that food is coming. Um, this kitten is all kinds of trouble. Go <laughs> I can't see. It's like black right down there, so I could barely even tell she was there. There she is. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, uh, nope, she wants to walk on the on the computer. Um, so, <laughs> there's two of them, but she's the troublemaker. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, um, so again, it seems like that praise that that interaction from their owners is, is again another uh, thing that's very important for dogs. And I think this is one thing that surprises people a lot um, because you know. Um, people often think that dogs love them because they provide them food. <laughs> um, and I think this, this shows that that's not necessarily true, right? Um, that dogs uh, love people independently of the food um, and they love people more than the food um, that, that might be coming. So, um, yeah. So, All right. Um, All right. That, and that, that is so cute and fascinating. Um, uh, and before we, we kind of move on to dog human interactions, I just, wasn't really planning on asking this, but um, 
it occurred to me, some people claim that uh, among humans, our kind of like unique ability in the animal kingdom is um, episodic future thought. And I'm just wondering what, what your opinion is. Do you think dogs or, or any other animals that you've studied have um, episodic future thought, which I guess uh, I should define for people is, is basically imagining, a, a explicitly imagining the future, um, unless you have a different definition for it. Yeah, I, you know, it's one of the problems that we uh, comparative psychologists encounter in our work all the time is how do we ask animals a question? Um, and, you know, how do we ask about their memory or their um, spatial reasoning or whatever it might be? Um, and it's not easy, right? Coming up with how to answer this question is, is really difficult. Um, we, a lot of us, um, uh, myself included, are trained as developmental psychologists. So my PhD is in developmental psychology, although I have not, um, you know, done any research with uh, human kids since graduate school. <laughs> um, and, and that's because we encounter the same problems that developmental psychologists do, which is that our, um, especially the infant people, our species, our, our subjects don't talk to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't know, um, you know, with human adults, you can say, here are the instructions, sit down and do this thing, <laughs> or like, tell me how you're, you know, how you're thinking through this problem, right? You can, you can talk to them and they can talk to you. Um, our dog subjects cannot do that. <laughs> following directions is not, you know, we can give them simple directions like sit and stay, um, which some of them can follow, others cannot. <laughs> um, but we can't really give them the instructions about what we want them to do or how we want them to think about the task. And we also can't ask them, you know, how did you think about that task? Or what, oh, you know, how easy was this compared to another task? Um, and so that's where a lot of this sort of gets, gets stuck. Um, some work, I think the cleverest work that's been done looking at this sort of planning for the future um, kind of stuff has been done um, with non-human primates um, because they are tool users. And so you can look at, um, you know, uh, you know, this is a problem that you've encountered in this situation before. Uh, for example, um, you need to use a rock and a um, and a log and you need the log to put the nut on and then you need the rock to crack open the nut so you can get to it. Um, and so the question then is, are they going to sort of uh, uh, hang on to these toolkits? Are they going to create a toolkit and hide it somewhere where they might need mm -hmm. it again in the future? Um, are they going to um, uh, keep and keep track of these kinds of things that are useful now because they might need them next week, right? Um, and yes, uh, non-human primates are pretty good about doing that. Um, I am trying to remember um, studies with dogs looking at this planning for the future um, stuff. And the last time I checked on this, there wasn't much. Um, uh, that doesn't mean there isn't anything now, um, because I just moved and my life has been chaos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I've been out of the loop for a few months. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think that it's a really uh, interesting, this is another one of those places where the answer is frustrating. It's, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I think those are also really fun places to be, um, you know, as a, as a researcher is in that I don't know, um, because, uh, you know, it gives you uh, places to go out and, and study and figure out things. Um, but it also, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just kind of cool to be kind of there in that, like, working on these problems um, that people want to know about and that we, we don't really have answers to. Um, yeah. I suspect that dogs have some sense of the future, but I don't know that they have um, that sort of episodic like um, um, idea about what the future might be. I, I genuinely have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got, yeah. Well, there you go. Um, yeah. And that, that issue that just really quick, that issue that you mentioned about um, the difficulty of assessing animals, different cognitive abilities. Uh, real, I don't know if you've checked it out, but a really great book on that back here is uh, are we smart enough to know how Smart Animals Are by Franz DeWall, oh, yeah. um, who's a primatologist and really goes into depth on, on a lot of that. So I definitely recommend that to people listening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I guess moving on to uh, um, dog-human interactions and kind of getting back to the, the brain a little bit. 
Um, you talk a little bit about oxytocin and uh, what it has to do with dog human interactions. I'm wondering if you can explain that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so oxytocin is this uh, hormone that is often associated with uh, pair bonding. So um, when, when mothers are nursing infants, for example, um, they get oxytocin rushes, both the mother and the infant. Um, and so, um, uh, I'm sorry, there's my doorbell is ringing. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's just a package, um, dog food actually. Oh, nice. <laughs> So, um, so, uh, so when oxytocin, um, uh, is sort of, uh, flooding the brain, that's when we get a lot of this sort of pair bonding stuff. Um, I do want to mention that oxytocin is, uh, involved in lots of other kinds of things as well. Um, it, it has a lot of, it has a lot of sort of, uh, roles in, um, social behavior. So, uh, it can be associated with trust and with, um, forming new kinds of relationships. So it's, it's involved in a lot of kind of social stuff. People often call it the cuddle hormone, uh, but it's much more than that. <laughs> it does a lot of things. Uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, so when, so dogs and humans form this oxytocin feedback loop. So when we look at our dogs, um, and they look at us, um, both of our brains are exploding with oxytocin. Um, and, uh, and so you can see, um, this, this is why a lot of times when you're having a rough day, if you come home to your dog, um, you know, you might start to feel better is because your dog is, is releasing those oxytocin, um, uh, hormones in your brain and you're doing the same thing to your dog. Um, you can see oxytocin, um, differences in, um, different, um, strengths of relationship between dogs and people. So, um, for example, um, dogs with, um, uh, with really close relationships with their, with their person, uh, tend to have more oxytocin, um, mm. and people who report the, those close relationships with their dogs also show more oxytocin when they are, um, uh, engaged in, in, you know, mutual eye gaze, for example, with their, with their dogs. So, um, so you can see, um, uh, that oxytocin feedback loop is, is a pretty powerful, uh, interaction between humans and dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I must have a lot of oxytocin going whenever I see my dogs. I'm, I'm definitely a, a overly exuberant dog person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, another really interesting thing that you talk about is training dogs and, um, the kind of the differences between using reward and punishment and, um, and, and you kind of land on the side of, of reward being a superior way of training and I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the evidence for that. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said about training, lots and lots of things to be said about training. <laughs> Um, and in fact, you know, I, I know a lot about dog training, but I also have a trainer who works with me and my dog, because a lot mm -hmm. of times when you're working with your own dog, it can be hard to see the, um, strategies and, and ideas and, and things that might work. Um, you know, because you're so stuck in that, uh, in that relationship, sometimes you need an outside perspective. Um, Olive is, is reactive to other dogs. And so having somebody else who can, uh, look at her behavior while I'm in the moment, trying to deal with the eruption of, uh, of chaos <laughs> can be incredibly helpful. So, um, so I, I suggest, I, and then I took, I've taken all of my dogs to basic obedience class because I think, uh, those kinds of interactions are great for every dog. So, um, I'm big dog training believer. Um, I think, um, there's a lot to be said about, about different dog training approaches, but, um, but the one that does seem to have the most evidence behind it is using positive reinforcement, um, for, um, teaching dogs to do things that we like them to do. So, um, this is something we've probably all done to teach our dogs to sit. So you ask your dog, you know, you may lure your dog back into a sit with a treat and then give them the treat and tell them sit, you know, good job, good sit, um, uh, and have a little party. <laughs> <laughs> and dogs often learn that really quickly and really well. Um, so, so positive reinforcement can be very helpful in, um, in teaching dogs new things. Um, punishment is less so. Um, so punishment, and here I'm going to um, specifically talk about positive punishment, which mm. is adding something in um, to decrease the probability of behavior. So um, 
you know, yelling at your dog, no, no, um, or, um, you know, using a, like a choke chain or a prong collar or something like that um, to get them to stop um, doing a particular behavior. It's usually not so useful because uh, it doesn't teach the dog what you want them to do instead. So um, uh, the sort of best combination here is to ignore the behaviors you don't want and mm -hmm. reinforce the behaviors that you do. So, um, so when, when I'm taking Olive for a walk and she sees another dog and she bubbles over into chaos, <laughs> I'm going to ignore that chaos and I'm going to um, reinforce every time she looks at me. So that's what I want. I want her looking at me. Um, so treat, she looks at me, treat she looks at me treat and we are walking along moving past that um you know uh trigger of of excitement um so um so i'm reinforcing the behaviors that i want um and ignoring the behaviors that i don't want i'm not yelling at her i'm not i don't i use a harness so i don't use a you know an aversive collar or a shock collar or anything i'm telling her what i want her to do because a lot of times um dogs you know, it's easy to say, no, that's not what I want, but it's harder to say, yes, this is what I want. It's harder for them to figure out what they should do um, mm. when they're faced with no, no, no. Um, another technique that, that I think is um, one that has served me well with Olive and has served a lot of people well as well um, is capturing good behavior. So I just try and keep treats on me all day. And when she's doing something that I like, I just give her a treat for it. So, um, you know, she's relaxed sleeping next to me right now. Um, I like that. I'm going to give her a treat for it. Right. Um, she's playing nicely with the kitten. <laughs> I like that. She's going to get a treat for it. So, um, so just kind of telling her throughout the day, these are good things. I like these, these things that you're doing. Um, is a lot more powerful than no, 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 no. Um, and I think a lot of that um, sort of idea of um, telling your dog that sort of punishment kind of training um, is, is based on a misconception about who dogs are. Um, and so this is this idea that, um, you know, in order to uh, live a good harmonious life with people, dogs need a strong pack. So they need a strong pack leader who's going to tell them, you know, lay down all of the rules and enforce the rules and dogs need to know where they are in the pack structure. And that's um, the kind of Caesar Milan, uh, dog yes. whisperer approach. Exactly. So that is this, definitely the Caesar Milan approach. Um, there are plenty of other trainers who take that approach, but he's the, um, he's oh. the one in the public eye. He's the one with the TV show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. And so, um, but this is, this is based on some really uh, faulty research. So um, people came up with this idea based on observing wolves at, um, in captivity, um, many years ago, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and so uh, the, the wolves in this captive group uh, really did seem to have this, this uh, pack structure where you have sort of the alpha who's in charge and then all the other wolves have uh, ranks that fall underneath it. And then they sort of fight for dominance within that structure. Uh, but uh, when you actually look at what real wolves do in the wild, it's a very different structure. Um, in the wild, they have these family units where you've got the parents um, and the parents are kind of the alphas, I guess they're kind of in charge. Um, but because they're parents, right? <laughs> because they're the parents, they're in charge. Mm. Um, and then you get um, sort of the older siblings that stick around for a while. And then you've got the, the younger siblings um, and the, the pups. Um, and so um, a lot of times what you'll get is, is that those older siblings stay for a few years. Um, and then once they're ready to go off and form a pack themselves and find a mate um, and start their own family, then they go. So it's not a struggle for dominance and power so much as a family unit that kind of supports each other and sticks around and helps, um, helps with the family until they're ready to go start a family of their own. Um, there's not a struggle for power. There's not a strict dominance hierarchy, you get the parents and then you get the kids. <laughs> um, and, um, and they're all kind of working together towards this common goal. 
Mm -hmm. um, but of course, if you take that, those animals and you put them in a small captive environment, um, they're not going to behave typically, right? They're going to start to behave in strange ways. Those, those teenage wolves who want to go off and form a family of their own and leave um, are not able to. Uh, so then, of course, you're going to get scrabbling. You're going to get fighting. You're going to get uh -huh. all kinds of stuff going on that's not typical. Um, I think that all of us would agree that the last few years have not been typical <laughs> for humans as we've been um, sort of stuck in, in isolation. Um, and, uh, and so I think nobody would want our behavior um, the last few years to sort of be the defining way that we think about humans. Um, and I think that that's what's going on with the wolves. Um, and on top of it, dogs and wolves are different species, right? Dogs uh, even if wolves had this strict dominance hierarchy, dogs are different. Um, they are different from wolves in a lot of different ways. And so we really shouldn't expect them to act in wolf-like ways. Um, when you actually look at the research and you actually look at what, um, uh, what leads to better behavior change in, um, in dogs um, over time, it is the positive reinforcement. Um, punishment leads to all kinds of, it might look good in the moment, like Caesar Milan certainly is able to get a dog to behave uh, very quickly, um, but it usually doesn't last. Um, mm. And often punishment will lead to sort of rebound aggression um, in the future. So it's, it's not a good long-term strategy. Wow. Yeah. So punishment is kind of a, a blunt instrument that may work in the short term, but doesn't really give yep. you the kinds of behaviors that you're, you're looking for. Exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. And one thing that's really important um, for dogs is the relationship with their person. And so um, when you're punishing a dog for doing dog things, um, that's damaging that relationship with their, with their owner, with their handler. And so the chances that you're going to get a dog to behave um, down the road are, are slim, especially you know when there's a crisis or when there's an emergency, um, that's really when you want your dog <laughs> um, really to listen to you. Um, and a dog who's, who's afraid of their owner is less likely to sort of trust and, and uh, listen to their owner in a, in a moment of panic um, than a dog who has a really good, strong relationship with their, with their person. Oh, wow, okay. That is really interesting. And, and you, you mentioned that there's these kind of different ideas about what dogs and how we should think about dogs uh, compared to us, compared to humans. And you said that they shouldn't be thought of as kind of subordinates in a wolf pack. Um, yeah. And then there's kind of two other ideas like of yeah. the, the sort of friend slash companion idea. And then the the, that there are children on the other hand. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about what, how should we think about dogs? Uh, what, what are they to us? Yeah, you know, a lot of people take, so the, this, this view that dogs are kind of wolves is known as the lupomorph view. Um, and so they've named another view, uh, the baby morph view, <laughs> which is this idea that our, our dogs are kind of our babies, right? That there are children. And, and on the surface, it seems really, um, to describe a lot of the relationships that we have with dogs. I mean, like I decide when Olive is going to eat, what she's going to eat. I decide when and where she's going to use the bathroom. I decide what her activities of the day look like. Um, she goes to summer camp. Um, <laughs> a lot of human children. <laughs> um, so, um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of that sort of parent child relationship that you can see um, similarities between humans and dogs. Um, but that's, that certainly describes some relationships between humans and dogs, but not all of them. If you think about most dogs in the world, most dogs are actually their pariah dogs, which is sort of a street dog or kind of a wild dog that lives in the vicinity of people, but is not somebody's pet. Um, and so it certainly doesn't capture those dogs. Um, it doesn't capture, like, I, I don't think anybody would say that a, a police dog has a relationship like that with its handler, um, or that um, you know, a, a livestock guardian dog has that relationship with the farmer, right? And so mm. that kind of baby morph view certainly could capture some relationships with between dogs and owners, but it's a really narrow <laughs> relationship. Um, a sort of a broader way to think about our relationships with dogs is to think about them in kind of a, like a social network um, kind of a, of a model kind of like a friendship, right? So um, that 
Uh, we have different kinds of relationships with dogs. Dogs have different kinds of relationships with us, just like we do with people. So, you know, I have different kinds of relationships with my friends. I have some friends who I talk to every day. Um, you know, we, we uh, support each other in like all kinds of different ways. I have other friends who I, um, you know, only talk to every now and then. Um, but when we do, you know, it's really great and they're really helpful and I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm helping them. You know, there's, there's different kinds of relationships that we have with different people. Um, and, and you can think about that with dogs too, right? Um, the kind of relationship I have with Olive is a different kind of relationship than I had with my previous dog, Cleo, right? It's a different, it's a different thing. Um, and the kind of relationship that I have with Olive is different than the kind of relation that I had with Olive and with Cleo is different than the relationship I have with um, my sister's dog, Watson, right? So it's like different kinds of relationships with different um, individuals. And, um, and I think that that captures um, the kinds of relationships we have with dogs sort of more broadly. You can get those sort of baby morphs in there, those, those cases where you're taking your dog to summer camp. <laughs> <laughs> you can also get relationships where you've got, um, you know, the police handler working with the police dog and you've got the farmer with their livestock guardian, right? It, it sort of captures a much broader range of the types of relationships um, that individuals have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that really clarifying. Um... And uh, kind of within this realm of, of training and interacting with people, something you mentioned is uh, social facilitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we kind of talked about that, I guess, a little bit when we were mentioning working dogs and, and hunting dogs. And uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about what that is and, and some examples where dogs uh, exhibit that. Yeah. Um, so social facilitation is when you are um, with others social creatures, um, whether that's humans or dogs or whatever species we're talking about. Um, and um, being in the presence of those individuals um, uh, helps you engage in a particular behavior more. So, um, uh, so I, the example I always use is that I'm a, um, I'm a long distance runner um, who's not very fast. Um, I can run all day, but I'm not gonna go very fast. Uh, but I do have some friends who are sort of shorter distance runners. Um, and when I run with them, uh, they run faster because they're running shorter distances. Um, and so when I run with them, I speed up, <laughs> I run faster. Um, when they are joining me on my training run where we're gonna run for a long time for a shorter, at a um, slower pace, they're gonna slow down and run, run at my pace. So, um, so social facilitation is that sort of modulating the pace to the, uh, to the group. Um, and you can see that same exact exact behavior in dogs. Um, so when dogs run together, they modulate their paces. So the fast dog slows down and the slow dog speeds up um, and they sort of meet somewhere in the middle. Um, my favorite, my all time favorite example of social facilitation um, in dogs is um, if you feed puppies, so the puppies are not hungry um, and they, they've eaten and there's still food available, but they're not hungry, they're not eating it. Um, if you then take a hungry puppy and add it to that group of puppies um, and it starts eating, all of the other puppies start eating. <laughs> so like, I feel like this happens to me all the time um, when I go out to eat with people, um, you know, <laughs> everybody sits around and is like, oh, I couldn't eat another bite. And then they come around with the dessert menu. Um, and somebody's like, oh, I could have a little creme brulee. And then it's like, everybody orders dessert. Everybody's always hungry. room for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so those are ways that you can see social facilitation um, in, uh, in both humans and in dogs. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's really interesting. I was thinking of um, my mom's dog and our dog, uh, when they get together, my dog, he will eat anything you give him but she her dog is much more picky and um will smell it for a long time but if we give him some food uh she's like much quicker to eat it when you when you hand it over to her and maybe that's just because oh he'll get more of it if i don't just wolf this down immediately but something like yeah. that anyway i mean i i definitely have seen that in mine too uh, my previous dogs cleo and charlie Cleo did not ever, she, she always had, um, uh, she was a runner with me in her youth. Um, and then she, when she was about 11 or 12, she started to develop arthritis and had to take uh, medication for her arthritis. Um, and, uh, and she never wanted to take it. She was not, she did not want to take the pill. Uh, but if I, and then, so I put it in peanut butter and she was like, 
I know there's a pill in there. <laughs> I'm not having it. <laughs> so I would give a little bit to Charlie first. Um, and then I, and then Cleo was, would be like, oh, okay, it's gotta be fine. I'll take it. So, <laughs> so we can use social facilitation to our advantage. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Now we know about it too. We can all use it. Um, so a couple of things. Um, so one thing I found really fascinating, I never heard it before that you talked about the, um, people's ability to decode dog barks and, mm -hmm. and that this may be even a universal phenomenon among humans. I just found that amazing. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, a group of, of researchers did this really fascinating study, um, where they took dogs barking in different contexts. So, um, I might not remember all of them, but I'll get many of them. Um, so, um, an aggressive context, um, an approaching stranger, uh, play, maybe food. Um, so lots of sort of lots of different kind of varied contexts with different kinds of emotional, uh, you know, undertones. And uh, and what they found was that uh, dogs, uh, you know, people could listen to these dog barks and um, and then categorize them appropriately um, most of the time. So you could hear a dog barking in an aggressive context and tag that as aggressive or in a play context and tag that as play. Um, and the thing that makes this, I think, so cool is that you don't have to be a dog owner to be able to do this. So you don't have to have a ton of experience with dogs. Um, little kids can do this. Um, you know, they haven't had a lot of experience just in general, yeah. <laughs> um, but they can still do this. Um, and you don't ever have to have seen the connection between the dog bark and the behavior. Um, so people who are visually impaired can do this. So they've never seen a dog barking in an aggressive context um, and demonstrating aggressive behavior because they haven't seen, you know, they don't have the visual input to see the behavior, um, but they can hear it um, and, and, and tag it as aggressive. So it does seem like there's something, you know, that, that, that not only did we shape dog evolution, <laughs> but they have shaped us too, and that we are biologically prepared to um, recognize some of their communication. Um, and it's not just us, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are other species like prey species, um, sheep, for example, um, who listen to uh, dog growls and can determine whether it's a big dog or a little dog. Oh, wow. <laughs> what kind of, uh, you know, should I be afraid of this or not, um, and, uh, and respond appropriately. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um... And on the other hand, uh, what do dogs understand about our speech? Like, I guess the, the content of speech. Yeah, um, it's, this is another one where people are doing work right now um, on this very question. Um, there is a group of researchers in California who are working on um, uh, some of these TikTok famous dogs like uh, Stella and Bunny um, who use the assistive button uh, buttons to communicate. I don't know if you're, if you're familiar. I haven't. Wow. Yeah. So they, they have um, buttons like kids have um, who are nonverbal. Um, and so they can hit the button and it says something like walk. Um, and so they, you know, go for a walk or it says treat. Um, and so they're using them to communicate with their owners in some interesting ways. So um, that uh, people ask me about that all the time. Um, and I sort of punt and say, let's wait another little bit and see what they make of it in Cal out in California. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we do know that dogs recognize a lot of our human um, communication. So um, they recognize somewhere around 30 um, to 35, I believe, um, individual words on average. So uh, you know, many of these are words that we've taught our dogs like um, sit or come or stay. Um, but others are words that they've picked up just through living with us. So um, walk or, um, uh, okay, she's still asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Don't um, say it too loud. Yeah, exactly. Um, outside is another one. Um, uh, you know, dinner. Um, these are all words that, that many of, of our dogs have, have picked up over time. Um, um, and so they, they're doing both, right? Parsing words out um, that are important to them, but also learning individual words based on our instruction. Um, some dogs are incredible at this. <laughs> so um, there are a few Border Collies um, who have learned 
vocabularies into the thousands um, where they um, have individual words for different objects and uh, use them appropriately. So for example, um, one of them is uh, Chaser. Chaser passed away uh, not very long ago, um, but uh, she had, I think it was 1200 words for different items. So she had all these toys and all the toys had different names. And so there could be a bunch of toys in a pile um, and her owner could tell her, you know, get octopus. Um, and she would go in and look through all the toys and get the octopus. Um, and really uh, fascinating uh, was how that how she learned this. So um, she learned it by, um, uh, it seems like she learned it by sort of exclusion, which is a way that, that young kids learn too. So she's faced with a big pile of toys and she knows all the names for all of them. Um, and then there's a new toy that doesn't have a name. And you say, um, get me Blicket. Um, and um, she goes and she looks and she's, she knows all the names for the other ones. So this new toy that I don't have a name for must be Blicket. Um, and, uh, and she picks up Blicket and brings it in. And yes, that's the right one. And then she'll have that name for that toy forever from there on. So she doesn't need to um, uh, learn it through training. She's learning it um, using a process um, that uh, that human and human toddlers use called fast mapping, which is this exclusion. Um, you know, I don't know the name. Or I know the names for all these other things. I don't know the name for this. It must be this. Um, and now I've got that. Um, and so it's really, um, yeah, it's it's really fascinating um, to to see how they learn. Uh, but this um, and more is still work that people are working on um, and trying to figure out. There, there's a new dog. Um, uh, whiskey, um, who learned uh, a bunch of names for objects um, uh, just by playing with her owners. So they were not doing anything, any explicit training, um, but she just learned it through, picked it up through through play. So wow. it seems like there are lots of different, they're pretty flexible, um, but it also does seem like a lot of this, um, a lot of the animals that are able to do this are border collies. Um, and again, border collies are used to working, they're bred to work very closely with individual, with humans. Um, and so it's not a huge surprise that they would be the ones picking up on this. Um, some of the other dogs like Bunny, um, uh, the TikTok dog um, who uses the buttons um, is a poodle, another breed that works closely with people. So, um, so some of the research that they're doing is sort of saying, is this a border collie thing? <laughs> um, can we see this in other breeds of dogs? Um, why is it that the ones who seem to be sort of spontaneously doing this or able to do this really, really well, why is it that those are border collies? So these are lots of open questions um, as well. Yeah, yeah, plenty of room for more research. Um, and a lot, I guess a lot of what we've been talking about just points to this intense connection between dogs and humans. And um, something I found really interesting, it was your discussion of Williams syndrome and uh, what that may have to do with dogs and dog genetics. And yeah. just wondering if you could explain that a bit. Sure, yeah. Um, so Williams syndrome is a, um, uh, is a uh, syndrome um, in, in humans uh, that results uh, um, from uh, changes to chromosome number seven, I believe. Um, and um, th this is a, a, mutations on the genome are really common. Um, we all have mutations <laughs> on our genomes, um, but most of the mutations don't lead to any behavior change or any physical, you know, um, manifestation. Um, most mutations just are nothing. Um, but some mutations are beneficial, some mutations are not beneficial. Um, so for example, there are mutations that are associated with, um, in humans, with resistance to HIV, um, which is beneficial. And then there are mutations that are associated with things like cystic fibrosis, right? Not beneficial. Um, uh, and so one of those is, uh, is Williams syndrome. So these are um, deletions on chromosome number seven. Um, and what, what this results in is, um, is people, typically um, young children, who are incredibly social, so massively social. They, they've never met a stranger. They're gonna go up to anybody. They're gonna talk to anybody. Um, they are chatty, they are friendly. They are extremely interested in other people. Um, and when you look at dogs, um, when you look at the dog genetics, um, it looks like they have some of these exact same mutations on chromosome number seven that are associated with Williams syndrome, um, which could explain their incredible hypersociality towards people. 
Um, and in fact, we do know that there are breed differences in, um, you know, how, how attracted dogs are to people. So um, golden retrievers, for example, are going to be much more uh, exuberant in their <laughs> feelings toward people than, um, you know, a German Shepherd might be. Um, and so what you see is more of those variations in, that look like Williams syndrome um, uh, on the uh, DNA of those breeds, like wow. the German Retriever, um, than on the DNA of the breeds that are a little more aloof. So yeah, wow. so this is all new, hot off the presses stuff. <laughs> so it'll be really interesting to see where it uh, moves in the next few years. That's so cool. It's such a, like a lovely story. Um, and so I know we're, we're getting close to our time here and I've just got kind of some, some big questions. And this one does still have to do with our connection to dogs. Um, so given everything we've talked about and our, our history with dogs, what do you see as kind of the, the ethical obligations that we have toward them? Yeah, this is a uh, this is a big question, and and one, one that actually I teach a dog cognition class, and that's the sort of central question yeah. of the course is um, given um, uh, given all the things we know about their cognition and their needs and the kind of things that can make them happy. What do we owe to them, especially because we keep them captive, right? Um, Olive is here with me on the couch. She can't just like go have an adventure by herself, right? Um, what do I owe her? Um, I, I really started asking these, these questions um, back when I, I worked with non-human primates before I worked, moved back into dogs. Um, and I did a lot of work um, actually with my dad, who's a bioethicist. Um, so, um, so we team taught some courses together sort of with this central question, about, but about um, zoo animals. So when we have animals in captivity, what do we owe them? Mm. And I think that... Um, that it really comes down to, um, we owe them understanding. So we need to um, understand um, their cognition, right? How, how do they perceive the world? How do they um, make decisions in the world? Um, how do they interact with us? What do they think of us, right? We, we need to understand our dogs so that we can then um, give them the best lives that we can. So um, for example, one thing that um, is new to many people um, is just how good a dog's sense of smell is. Um, so it's 10 to 100,000 times better than our own sense of smell, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, I, a lot of my friends joke like, oh, well, um, then, you know, here they are living in an incredibly stinky environment. <laughs> these kittens, we've got a litter box in here, like, you know, like, it's, uh, you know, I owe them a cleaner place. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they experience the world through their nose. And so what we owe them is a, um, the ability to do that. So um, there's an incredibly simple thing that we can do that, in, that can improve the lives of our dogs immediately, um, which is that we can take them on um, it's called many different things, a sniffy walk, a sniffari, a dog led walk, <laughs> lots of different ways to think about it. Um, but, um, but, a, but essentially what it is, is just, I, I take Olive out on a long line. So I take her out on a 25 foot uh, long leash um, and, um, and she makes the decisions. So of course I keep her safe and make sure she's not running in the road or anything that we are in a safe environment when she's on, when she's got the full 25 feet. Um, but uh, it's, uh, she makes the decisions about when we're going to stop, how long she's going to sniff, um, uh, when we're going to move on, what direction we're gonna go. Um, uh, it's her walk to do what she wants. Um, these can be very frustrating for people <laughs> because we live in a world of visual, a visual world and an auditory world. Uh, we're not getting any of the information that dogs are getting by scent. Um, and so, for example, I had my parent, my dad had his hip replaced um, a few weeks ago and I had their dog, uh, my parents' dog, while he was recovering. And so I took the two of them, Olive and my parents' dog, on a, on a sniffari. Um, and we got maybe, I mean, like I can see it from my sunroom as far as we got. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and there they, had, they found a log that had a chipmunk in it. Um, and they spent 45 minutes <laughs> at that log. Um, oh, wow. We did not leave that log. <laughs> um, they were fascinated. Um, 
it was a very boring walk for me, um, except that I did watch the chipmunk pop out. One of them was at this end of the log. The other one was at this end of the log. And the chipmunk came out from the middle and took off. But and then they still spent half an hour. <laughs> ah, the, the remnants of the, it's yeah. still in there. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but they, um, you know, they, they were getting a lot of, of information. They were really stimulated. Um, uh, sniffing provides a lot of mental stimulation, a lot of um, uh, necessary dog specific kind of behavior for them. Um, I get asked a lot about, um, about this because um, a lot of people walk to exercise their dogs and make them tired, right? Because the idea here is that a tired dog is a good dog. Um, but uh, Olive came back, Olive and Blue, my parents' dog, came back from that sniffari um, and were done for the rest of the day. That was uh -huh. it. All they did was stand there and sniff for 45 minutes. They did not exercise, <laughs> um, but they were mentally exhausted because they were trying to triangulate that scent. They were doing all kinds of, um, you know, there was cooperative work where one would, you know, they'd sort of switch spots and they were digging and they were doing all kinds of stuff. They were mentally exhausted. Um, again, I take Olive on runs with me. She's, a, she's learning to be a long distance runner. Um, and she comes back from runs and she's tired for a little while, um, but then she needs some action. She needs something to do. Um, but those sniffaris are, um, are really great. Um, so I encourage everybody to take your dog on a sniffari. Um, uh, I, I tend to uh, set, a, set a time. So like, we're gonna go for half an hour, we're gonna go for an hour or whatever. Um, and we just go as far as we go. Um, when we go on an exercise walk or, or run, um, we will go much farther <laughs> um, on that run than we will on the safari. Um, and just uh, know that you're, you're not going to get very far, but your dog is really going to appreciate that. You'll, you'll often see that they are calmer, um, that they are happier, um, that they're living sort of their best doggy life. Um, there are lots of things that we can do. Like we also know that dogs um, prefer to work for their food than to be given their food for free. So uh, mm. giving them... Um, you know, uh, food puzzles or having them eat their food out of a snuffle mat or a Kong wobbler or a, you know, even working for, the, for their food with a sit and a stay and a down or a whatever um, is more enriching for your dog than just eating out of the bowl. Um, and so I think all of these, these ways that we've learned about dog cognition can really inform uh, the ways that we are um, ethically treating our, our pets. Uh, that, yeah, that, that's, I love that. Um... And I wonder if with this sniffaris, uh, it's, I, I guess you could compare it to the fact that we, we like to go out and just look at things. We hike up whole mountains just to look at the, the landscape or we'll sit and listen to music. I mean, our brains are so, uh, as you mentioned, visual and auditory. And so it makes sense that, that they would need some kind of outlet to get that, that stimulation and that kind of diverse uh, kind of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. But um, I guess, you know, I think that's a, a good place to leave it. Um, Ellen, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been really fascinating. And I think everybody who has dogs or just is ever sees dogs or is around them is going to get something out of this. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Great. All right, well, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of Sense of Mind. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and the podcast. Also consider giving this show a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you use. And be sure to sign up for the newsletter by going to senseofmindshow.com slash newsletter. You'll get a new episode every week delivered directly to your email inbox. As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.